Uh, welcome, Dr. Jameson. Thank you very much uh, for meeting me on Zoom. It's a real honor uh, to talk to you here, and, and thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for, thanks for having me. It's, it's fun yeah. to talk about the research. Um, so I thought the IB psychology students, they'd get a, a kick out of putting a face to the name and be able to talk to like a real life psychologist, uh, someone, you know, who actually studies stress and emotion. Could you just tell us how, how did you become a psychologist who studies emotion and stress? Yeah, um, yeah I think a lot of yeah, professors I know, a lot of researchers I know got into this field in kind of circuitous ways. We didn't, we didn't really plan, like, oh, I'm going to become a professor, and that's what we're going to do. I mean, I came from a pretty blue-collar background um, in Boston, and I went to school. I was a biology major expecting to go to work for a drug company, and so I was just in psychopharmacology, and that was my main sort of go-to. I took one class. I read one. I read one no, yes, I read a paper. I read one paper um, by what ended up being my postdoctoral mentor, and it was about uh, biopsychosocial models and about how if we can perceive stress in this positive light, it actually can fuel performance in a positive way. And that kind of connected with me. Um, I was an athlete in college and I would just notice before games, like teammates of mine would be really amped up and excited and like, like, like get stress. <laughs> but then before an exam, they'd have the same response, but they'd be really nervous and like, hey, you realize that's the same thing. Um, not the same thing, but um, very similar. And so I got curious about that. And so I kind of just went down that route and um, I started sort of pushing into more social psych um, realms that way. And I never really like set a plan. It wasn't like, I'm like, Hey, I'm going to go to grad school. I just applied and my, my advisor took me. I don't know why, um, but it did. And then I did postdoc, um, with the research I was talking about, I read that paper from, and then but yeah, just keep pushing forward. I mean, really it's curiosity. Um, everyone I know uh, who does research for sort of a living is just really curious. Like we want, we're, we want to know why things work, how things work, like how can we fix, not fix things, but how can we sort of nudge people here or there to change behaviors in different ways. And that curiosity really sustains you through the research process. I mean, that, that is one thing people think it's exciting that you're doing these studies and you're putting sensors on people and you're getting all this biological data. Um, but in reality, it'll take us like two years to run a study. Every, every one person coming in, it's like an hour and a half per person at least. Um, and you do that two times across a lot of times. It gets it's a lot of, it's pretty tedious. And then processing the data, and analyzing the data, and then writing papers. So it's a lot of this, this kind of idea behind staying curious and staying sort of interested in everything that we're doing. Um, that really sort of drives us through. And even like grants and publications, like for me, like if I put, if I apply for 10 grants, I'd be thrilled if I get one or two. So it's a constant case of rejection, case of failure. And so learning how to sort of work through those failures and just sort of embrace those things and not let it um, impede what you're doing. That's sort of a major driver behind the whole of psychology. A lot of, not just psychologists, like just academic researchers in general. Uh, but that's where it's so great to study resilience, right? With all that. Yeah. No, uh, what was your sport as an athlete? I was an American football football player. Okay, I'm kind of tiny, but I can run real fast. Is what it is. All right, as a running back? No, I was defensive back, so okay. I was on the other side of the ball. I was playing some defense. Yeah. All right, I played wide receiver when I went to uh, Connecticut for high school, and I had no idea, I had no idea how to play, uh, and so they just put me a wide receiver, and I uh, had a blast. It was great. Oh, yeah, that's wild. Cool. Yeah, I mean, I have a rugby background from New Zealand, right? So, ah, okay, um, that makes okay. That, that transition makes a lot of sense. Uh, but the, it's funny that the, the connection between sports and psychology and with coping with stress. Uh, I was teaching a class a couple of years ago about top down appraisals and how our prefrontal cortex can regulate our, the emotion in the amygdala. And uh, a, a student told me on Monday after their basketball game, she said uh, during the game, she did just like a bonehead play and she ran over to a coach and said, it's not my fault. My prefrontal cortex isn't working properly. Uh, and like, I just got a kick out of that, you know, when the kids take what you're teaching them and put them in a real life context. Uh, so, uh, so the stress and the research where I came across your, uh, your particular studies in your research was looking at appraisals. And so for the IB psychology students in their course, they have an option called health psychology and they study, they can study one health problem. And so for that we look at stress. And so trying to look at stress from a cognitive psychological perspective, uh, I, I went to appraisals and reappraisals. Pretty, I made a video yesterday trying to explain for students what appraisals and reappraisals are. I don't think I did a great job. So could you help me out and give me a bit? No, I think you did a really good job. Um, um, it's, this, it's this fancy psychology jargon is what it is. No, these are, um, so it's cognitive processes. And so things in our brain that live there. 
And so the appraisals, um, what distinguishes those from belief systems, and so beliefs about mindsets. So I'm sure that the students go through psych class, they'll talk about mindsets. And so that's a belief about just the general, the way the world works. And so if mm -hmm. I have a growth mindset about intelligence, I think that you know, if you study, work hard, your intelligence can grow and you can learn. That's a belief about intelligence. Um, it's not an appraisal about intelligence. The appraisals are situationally grounded. Okay. And so what we're doing is we're assessing in the context of our models and things, we're assessing whether we can address the demands presented with. And so I'm going to go backwards a little bit. Mm. It, a lot of, I think, a lot of the work with stress is you run into this problem where you say stress and people immediately like, oh, like you study like really bad stuff. I'm like, well, like, yeah, sometimes, but sometimes, you know. And so they're like, the word stress is kind of a dirty word mm. um, in a lot of modern culture. But when we say stress, um, it's really important to distinguish that between stress and stressors. Mm -hmm. Like a stressor is something that's causing the demand. Mm -hmm. And so the stress is like you're, you're doing that, you're addressing that demand, but a stress response is responding to the stressor. You would praise the stressors in your capacity to deal with that. And so it's kind of like an assessment, like an evaluation. But your brain's doing it really fast and really almost automatically out a lot often. Like usually you don't think about this. Mm -hmm. And so when we're faced with a stressor, we have to determine, okay, can I handle this thing? And if we say, I can praise, okay, I have sufficient coping resources to take on this really difficult demand. Um, what are you telling your body essentially? Like, okay, cool, I can handle this. So your body's going to do things to get a lot of resources out to help you then approach that thing and address it. And when the stress offsets or goes away, then you go back to homeostasis really quickly. That's why sort of those approach oriented challenge type um, benign, I don't know what you want to call it, like de stress responses. Um, that's why they're, they're really pretty adaptive and they're pretty sort of health protective, not health damaging. Um, it's because, first of all, it's a lot of anabolic hormones floating around your system, which is good, <laughs> generally speaking, for common performance. More oxygen in your blood, in your brain. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you go back to baseline rapidly afterwards. So stress off after the offsets. So yeah, that that and the, so the appraisal it's it's that cognitive evaluation of what's going on in the world, your internal world and your external world. So I guess the easiest way of distilling that would be it's an evaluation that's grounded to a context. Right. So a context specific evaluation of a stressor, whether or not you can cope with it, right? And yeah. So we talk about evaluations of demands and resources, and mm -hmm. so those are the primary aspects of appraisals that um, that we talk about in our work a lot. Okay, yeah. and this has evolved from Lazarus and Folkman's research, right? In the early appraisal. Yeah, so that's, I get this a lot because people will come to me like, "Well, is is this demand appraisal? Is this a primary appraisal? And is the appraisal secondary?" I'm like, "Well, kind of, kind of not." And so, okay. Jim Blaskovich and Wendy Mendez, um, probably back in like the early aughts, like 2000s, um, the the biopsychosocial model of challenge and threat like grew out of the um, yeah. Lazarus appraisal model for motion. It's like an update to that model. And so it updated in the sense that it combined the primary and secondary appraisal into a single stage. So it's happening at the same time in this model, in the BPS model. Um, okay. And then what it was doing is because of primarily we're looking at appraisals driving the stress response. Mm -hmm. and so depending on how you appraise something, that's how your body responds. Like your stress axes in your brain, your body, they don't, like your adrenal glands don't have eyes or ears and they don't know what's going on. Like you tell it what's going on. And right. That's what the appraisals are. The appraisals tell the body how to respond to the stressor, how to um, enact different kinds of responses. That's great because that really was what was throwing me when I was, uh, first of all, trying to comprehend Lazarus and Folkman's model. Uh, it was pretty unwieldy and, and it was tricky, but I got my head around it. And then I came across the, the, the model of challenge and threat. And I was like, wait, hang on. There are so many contradictions here. But to hear, okay, that's an updated change version. Uh, I, that makes yeah, more sense. We, yeah, a lot of what, even like I was writing a chapter on specifically on appraisals. It's called just like stress appraisals and tackling all this and walking through like, okay, this is how we got from here to now here. It was very concerned about the cognitive, that last folks were very concerned about the cognitive, sort of the cognitive aspects of like when something was happening. Where BPS model is about, it's more about the stress response and what determines it. And so yeah. you can't associate like your appraisals of, um, how demanding is some stressor from your capacity to address that stressor? Um, they're not. They're not distinguished. They're, they're not, I guess, dissociable um, in our model because the, each of those together determines a stress response. Like if you have an extremely demanding situation, like let's say you have a really, really, really hard test. It's like a final. It's super important. It's a crazy hard test. Um, if you study and you believe in your ability to take on that test, 
you're going to have a sort of approach or the sort of benign good kind of challenge response. Um, if you have maybe a little quiz that's not so important, um, it's objectively less demanding than the big final exam, but if you haven't studied, you don't know any of that material, you're going to be threatened by that because your resources are, are lower than that demand. So you can't understand sometimes the demands of the stressors um, independently of understanding um, the appraisals of resources to address those stressors too. So, to, uh, so for a lot of students watching this, they might be getting lost with the BPS model. If we just backtrack a little bit, the, uh, the biopsychosocial model of challenge and threat, suggesting that how we appraise or reappraise stresses, correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, those different appraisals will lead to different physiological responses for the stress. So we could lead to a challenge response or a threat response, right? Challenge response is adaptive, beneficial. That'll help us deal with it. It's going to improve our cognition. Like okay. Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> sometimes not. Try, try, I, what I try to do is, is make it really concrete and clear for the students and then <laughs> I hide all the gray areas. And then once they comprehend it, then I go, yeah, but yeah. Uh, so we've got the challenge response. Um, it's an adaptive. And then the threat response is maladaptive or it's bad. I mean, over right? Yeah. Essentially. Okay. Uh, that's what is yeah, the appraisals or the fulcrum. That's what, so we first, so we're presented with the stressor. You get in that stressful situation. You're, mm -hmm. you're present there. Mm -hmm. You need to engage with the stressor first. You could, like, I mean, if I use the exam as an example, yep. you could choose to walk out of the room and not take the exam. Right. You're not going to experience any stress, but you're not going to do anything. <laughs> you're just going to fail the class and you're going to be much better life. Um, so first of all is engagement. Once we engage, that's then when the appraisals kick in. Like, okay, I need to then assess um, the demands I'm being presented with in my capacity to address those demands. And these are perceptions. That's why it's interesting. Appraisals aren't reality. And so people can think things are more or less demanding. The same person or two different people can think the same thing is more demanding than another person. Okay. And so appraisals are inherently subjective. Mm. And this is where a lot of people are sort of stressed about the idea of being stressed. Mm -hmm. And so appraising, you sort of notice that, okay, I start getting agitated. I get maybe like, like butterflies in my hand and my hands get sweaty. My heart's sort of racing. We notice that that then becomes a demand to us sometimes. We think that that means we're nervous. Mm. So we to try to get rid of that <laughs> um, instead of just focusing on what we're doing. But really it, all it is is if you sort of make like a, it's a, I mean, think of a scale, like there's a weight. So like you add in some demands on one side, it starts weighing down. Yeah, you think about your resources on the other side, it weighs it up. And so those resources are outweighing those demands. That's going to tip you towards a challenge type response versus a threat type response. And really what this is, is what the, um, the threat appraisals are doing like you're telling your body, I don't have the ability, I don't have the capacity to, to address the stressor that may present them with. All of our stress systems that exist in our body biologically, it's built on the architecture that was there to deal with physical stressors. Like right. Something's gonna hurt me or eat me. And so what your body's doing is like, oh, okay, you can't handle this. I'm gonna help protect you from the damage I think you're going to take. And so I'm gonna center blood in the core of your body so you don't bleed out. I'm going to release a lot of anti-inflammatories so you survive whatever inflammation is going to occur. And right. so all these things that were protective for us in the past when like, we actually were facing physical stressors, they're not so protective when we talk about social stressors, things like being evaluated, um, having an argument with somebody. Like you're not going to get physically injured in those situations necessarily. Usually. Okay, that makes perfect sense now. So because one of the things I was, uh, no matter how many times I read it in the literature, trying to distinguish the physiological differences between the challenge and threat response uh, was really hard for me to comprehend. I think I understood the challenge, but the threat wasn't quite as clear. But just to backtrack for students, so the challenge response is when you think you do have the resources to cope and the threat is when you feel like you don't have the resources. Absolutely. So really what you're telling your body, that the most basic distinction I can distill this down into is approach avoidance. Should I approach this stressor? Or should I avoid this stressor? And my, so if I'm, gonna, if I'm thinking that I can't handle this, your body's essentially assuming you're going to be facing damage or defeat in some way. So it's about minimizing that expected damage. Mm. And if the challenge response is about, okay, I need to then maximize how many resources I present and make active so you can take on that thing. So you can approach that thing and resolve it. And then we can go back to homeostasis and enjoy ourselves. Yeah. And so the body sort of should I approach or avoid this thing? That's a pretty basic distinction a lot in these challenge and threat models. And also, we, and it's hard to think, I know we think about challenge and threat as like these distinct states. Yeah. But really, it's like they're more anchors on a continuum of possible responses. Right. Very frequently, you can have something that's ambiguous, like maybe you're not sure, or like maybe you start off thinking, I can, oh, I can really take this on and I'm going to, I'm going to kill this test. And you start answering some questions, like, I don't know these questions. 
And so that challenge response can shift to a bet response. It, these appraisals are dynamic, but they're always changing too. Yeah. And so we've had, uh, yeah, so um, that aspect when we start evaluating um, the context and situation, it's, it's not like we do it once and then we should go. It's constantly churning. And so this is a nice sort of tie-in we talk about, like, I don't know if you talk about um, James Gross's extended process model of emotion regulation. We start talking more of these cultures about how emotions unfold over time. Like we think about emotions as these static things that happen, like one emotion, one emotion, one emotion. Mm -hmm. But really it's like we're existing in, in, the, in a continuous environment. And the same thing with stress. Until that stressor offsets, so until that exam is over, um, we're doing this appraisal process in the background a lot. Like we're not usually aware that we're doing this, but we are. I found this uh, so valuable and I hope the students will too, because I had a job interview earlier this week and I was freaking out about it. I, was, I felt my, my, my physiological stress response, but I thought to myself, hey, use this in the interview because this is going to help you think. You're going to be sharper. Your blood's pumping. I was trying to get that challenge response. So, I, you know, I would be able to answer better questions, think on my feet. And even interviewing you, I was nervous. I'm like, all right, okay, let's harness that. Let's, you know, you can use it to think sharper. So um, the challenge response, uh, that's one of the, uh, in, in one of your studies, uh, and I don't expect you to remember the names you've done so many over the last 10 years, the 2012 one, which I, I put in the research for the, in the book for the students. Um, and one of the measures was cardiac output, right? Which is the total volume of blood pumped from the heart. And that's beneficial because just more blood, more oxygen, better capacity to think, uh, to, uh, essentially. Yeah, that's exactly right. So yeah, more the, if you're putting more blood through your cardiovascular system per minute, you're delivering more oxygen um, to peripheral sites, including the brain. And so cardiac output combined with a, a decrease in peripheral resistance. So that's the resistance in the vasculature. And so you think like the heart can be pumping really fast. And so you're, we're threatened. We're like, we're really like our hearts are beating really hard. Um, but it's trying to squeeze like a lot of the liquid through like a small hose. So that the, the blood vessels don't dilate. And so our, our blood pressure, neotrial pressure goes way up. That's that peripheral resistance measure um, we see when people are threatened. But when we're challenged, like you see um, binding. So it's the bunny of, um, I think, what is it? I think it's, is it epinephrine or epinephrine? I think no, to beta two receptors. So catecholamines bind to beta two receptors and those dilate um, blood vessels. And there we have now more. So it's like now you have heart pumping hard, but also the hose is getting bigger. <laughs> so you can get all that blood with where it needs to go. Um, that the illustration in Kelly McGonigal's um, very popular TED talk of your study with the, just the, the dilated, uh, you know, the constricted. Yeah, Kelly, yeah, yeah, she does a great job with this. She's way better at speaking about this than I am. Um, but just that when I saw that image, I was like, oh, okay, that makes perfect sense. And that, that was, that was pretty helpful. Yeah, yeah no, it's, it's about it. So like really the, the basic, basic distinctions approach points. Should I take this thing on? Should I avoid it? And, so and generally, we um, need to take care of it. An approach, approach is generally across re stress research, right? The problem focused approach coping is generally more adaptive. Yes. Yeah. So a lot of like, well, I mean, my background is in affective science, technically, so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm an emotion researcher, really. <laughs> so we see the stress as a type of affective state. Mm -hmm. But um, we'll see very similar cardiovascular profiles when people are challenged and like so when they're excited and when they're angry. Um, anger also is a highly approach-oriented state. <laughs> and so you're, you're trying to take something on. Where you see the differences there is in the endocrine system. So anger doesn't offset as quickly as challenge, does it sticks around for a bit longer. And you typically see um, enough in cytokines as well as uptics in anabolic hormones as well. So there you see a little bit, so differences, it's funny looking at some of these things, I'm doing a study of maybe wanting to understand like anger versus threat. I might pop in more endocrine measures um, in that study. If I want just basic threat versus challenge, I think the cardiovascular measures are great because they're continuous. We can get these throughout the whole task, which is really, really nice. Okay, cool. So, um, just, so the, the students um, really need to comprehend the studies and it's very hard to take these big academic papers and boil it down to 150 words so students can comprehend the methodology and the results and make sense of it. It, it can be a tricky task. I mean, my, um, my graduate students have a hard time doing that. <laughs> yeah, it's here. very tricky. And so you always run the risk of oversimplifying and losing meaning. So um, one of the things uh, in, your, in the 2012 study where, so they do the, just to recap the methodology, they, um, your participants do the TRIA social stress test. Is it TRIA or TRIA? It's, a, it's TRIA, it's named after TRIA or Germany. So okay. It's a, so it's a, I call it Trier, and so okay. and I have like an Americanized accent of Trier, so that's probably what I'd say. I think uh, it's, it's fine. Yeah, it's a public speaking task. Um, yeah. I, I I still to this day don't like public speaking. I do it all the time in the classroom because I have to. But like I still get like like I'm, I still get really nervous when I have to talk in front of people. Um, yeah. And so it's always I, I always found that fascinating. That's that's the the gold standard stress induction that's used. I mean, mostly because it seems. 
benign to a research review board ethically, but it's actually pretty potent um, in terms of the stress that it produces. So it's a pretty, we call it like a sledgehammer manipulation where it will get your HPA access online. So it gets people threatened pretty, pretty easily. So I'm curious about the the ethics behind it. So we have to talk about ethics in our research in psychology and the so the informed consent process. Uh, do you tell the people, like how much do you tell them ahead of time before the study? Um, we see you be, be, be very ambiguous. So this is the, this is the rub with some social psych research because we right. study situational influences on people's behavior. Once they know what they're doing, um, that changes their behavior. And right. so what we need, so we need baselines. And so I want someone's baseline functioning in their cardiovascular system. If I tell them you're gonna do in a speech in like five minutes, right. not, that's not a baseline now. Yeah. Now that's an expectation. So okay. now they're anticipating doing a speech. Right. Um, and so there we actually do have anticipation phase as well. So the baseline we say, hey, you're gonna be doing some tasks um, while you're hooked up. <laughs> that's big. We just say like general, like some cognitive tasks. Okay. Yeah, and we keep we leave it at that, but we do get a second consent right before. So then we say, okay, baseline's over. What you're doing is giving a speech in front of these evaluators. Um, here they are. They're gonna be evaluating you on the quality of the speech, um, okay. how you deliver the speech. I mean, you need to talk for the full five minutes, and like, do you want to proceed? They need to provide like a, a recorded verbal like yes, and so it's a, it's a dual step consent process where that second consent is needed, and then after the study's over, we have a consent to data use. Form two, so they they could say they, if you want your data excluded from the study, that gets wiped um, at the end of the study um, if they don't consent to that as well. What so percentage? Really yeah. What percentage of people after they get told what they're going to do say I'm out? Uh, not many. I mean, okay. not, it's like yeah, like hey, I'm gonna talk about my personal strengths and weaknesses in front of people. Like yeah, sure. Like it's, it seems pretty benign. Um, yeah. Until you start doing it, like you don't know that people are going to be acting mean to you. That's that's so they don't you don't know the evaluators and you see seeing they're like the glaring at you and giving you yeah. another feedback. That's the so and then obviously they meet the evaluators after the study and they say, hey, like sorry, <laughs> it's like hard. It actually it's really if you if a lot of my RAs tell me this too. And this is I something I experienced when I was running these studies. Um, doing that negative evaluation, people is really, really hard. It's like so hard not to smile because you feel so bad. It's like, ah, you're doing a good job. It's not kind of a sinner if you mean to. You. But, yeah, because this is just young. I mean, when I, I saw that video um, of, of you running this, and it's just young post grade students, right, doing the being the evaluators, and you got to be a really good actor to hold up that. Oh, yeah, the morning do it. I mean, my RAs do this all the time. Right. <laughs> or they, or we have confederates too. They'll pretend to be the participant. Um, they're, it's amazing what they can do. And they have to like act the same way each time. And like we'll have like three or four people who like have to say the exact same thing for every person. So standardization is really important. That's why a lot of like we essentially write, um, we call them like recipes. It's a protocol, like a big packet that like you say exactly this at this right. time. This is what you do then. So that way we can, we, we have a decent sized labs. So we need to sort of coordinate between a lot of people. Um, but yeah, the RAs are, so my research assistants are all undergraduates, mostly at um, our university with just a few, like we have a few research staff that are my lab manager, my grad mm -hmm. students, but they do a lot of, I mean, I wouldn't be able to run any research about that because that would be impossible. Um, so the, uh, so they do the, the, the test and is it before they do the test, right? That's when you give them the different types of information. The reappraisal is good for you. Harness your strength, harness your stress like as a resource. The ignore, which is like a placebo condition where it's actually, it's, it's, and then it's the control. control. So we want to control this. Like, so the expectation, like, hey, we're going to give you something that's going to help you. Right. So it's believable enough where people try to say, hey, try to put stress out of your mind. Don't even think about it. Yeah. The problem is you tell someone not to think about something. That's what they think about. It's so, again, Wagner's uh, ironic processes. Um, the famous example is don't think of a white bear. And the right. first thing that pops in their mind is some image of white bear. <laughs> so they don't think of the stress while you do the stressful thing. Mm -hmm. They stress while you do the stressful thing. Yeah. And it sounds like it, it's advice people give though. Like, hey, try to like relax. Just try to put it out of your mind. Like this is the advice people give. Like it's not super helpful, but mm. we use it as expectancy control where they're expecting to get information that is going to help them. So, so we know that the reason why um, if we see improvements, it's due to the changing that appraisal process, not just to expecting that you're going to have something good's going to happen. Right. So it's like, yeah, it's a, it's a placebo, but it's an expectancy type um, mm -hmm. uh, placebo. So, and then, then, yeah. Yeah, then we have just nothing. They just, they just do nothing. <laughs> for the, some right. Yeah. And then, uh, so the, yeah, then they do the test. And then afterwards, 
Is it uh, during the test that you're measuring the cardiac output, doing the cardiac measures? Yeah, they're doing the entire time they're in our lab, they have sensors all over them. So they mm -hmm. have um, uh, impedance card sensors that are measuring the flow of blood through their chest cavity. Um, they have ECG sensors um, or EKG sensors that are measuring the electrical activity of the heart. Um, they have blood pressure cuffs on. They're giving those spit samples. So, so they're, they're doing a speech hooked up to all these plugs. Okay. Like, yeah, and if they move well, around too much, the evaluators say, stay still. Like you're moving too much. <laughs> right. So it's another way. Because the blood pressure cuff will have a hard time getting a reading um, if they move uh -huh. around really much. Um, and as a, so that that part was is pretty easy to comprehend, um, you know. The, and then you get the you get the challenge uh, response, right? The reappraisal group had more cardiac output, more of a challenge response, um, arguably more able to to um, to deal with the stressor. The emotional strip task was something that was new for me when I was reading that study, and I've got the um, I've got the idea behind it. But the the scoring, like um, the the in that particular study, you said that they had a increased attentional bias towards negative information. So does that mean that when they're reading the emotional Stroop words, it was faster or slower? Slower. So they were slower reading the of the words. So it was kind of like a regular Stroop task where you had, oh, did I freeze? Okay. Um, like the word, the regular Stroop task for the students, um, it's like the word blue is printed yep. in red ink. Yeah. Like you have to say, what is the, what is the, what is the color of the word printed? It's hard to say red in that case, not just read the word blue. Right. Um, what this task does, I actually took this from the clinical psych literature where I was, so I worked in a, um, a clinical lab as a postdoc. I was with um, Matt Knock um, at Harvard and he does a lot of research on suicide and on suicide self injury. And this is one of those measures they use to assess people's general vigilance towards um, negative information. And what it does, it has two lists of words. One word's like, they're all like, I guess they're neutral. They're scored, to, like, these are pre-scored to be like neutral um, in terms of valence. The words like planets or like clarets they're kind of like just regular words. <laughs> they're not positive or negative. Mm -hmm. um, and the words um, in the negative list are like really negative. Right. It's like, yeah, coughing. It's like all these things that are like, I don't know why I think of two death ones, but yeah, they're, they're not all like that. They're all like really negative emotional words. Mm -hmm. um, the idea is if you're attending to, if you're really drawn to that negative information, mm -hmm. you have a hard time disengaging from reading those words. And so you read the negative, the, the colors of the word, the negative words slower than you read the colors of the neutral words. Right. And so what you do is you see the more, I guess you're more biased towards a negative information, the more discrepancy between um, the, two, uh, the streets are. Yeah. Yeah. It's really pulled from the clinical literature, but it worked nicely here. And it was kind of following, following up on, um, we did a study um, that was looking at um, their actual emotional displays during the street task. So not during, so during the speech task. And so we coded that too. And so not just what's going on in their body, but what they're displaying outwardly um, to other people and their emotions too. We saw discrepancies between the reappraisal groups and the other mm -hmm. control groups as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the study that I found fascinating was when you went and took this in the field with the math students uh, at the community college. And oh, yeah, exactly. you could see... A few years later, 2016, uh, when you saw, okay, could this reappraisal actually help you in a real math exam? Uh, and their scores improved, not only in the short term, but over the semester. Yeah, we were stoked about that, because that, it's a hard group to reach in terms of, like, it's a massive group of students in the United States. And so, but just that there's not a lot of research with community college students. It's usually lo um, lower income students who are poor or students from underrepresented groups. And it's kind of the last stop in educational pipeline. If you don't get past that coursework, you can't matriculate to um, a four-year college. And then if you don't do that, if you don't get a degree, that massive limits um, earning potential is people's lifetimes. And so mm -hmm. it's a big sort of driver of inequality in the U.S. is this educational gap. Mm -hmm. So we're really excited to get access to those populations. And yeah, we, we went across a lot of different math classrooms and we, we gave them this, this information right before an exam in their class. So granted, like you're, we're, we're yoking this, this information, the reappraisals to like a specific exam. So it's easy for them to apply it. They just did it right there. They have sort of like practices and carry with them uh, for the future. Um, but we actually just published a follow-up to that. It came out like, I think like last month um, in the Journal of Experimental Psychology General. Um, it's that same sample, but we kept following them and we had saliva samples too. So while they were doing those, we actually took um, hormone samples as well. Mm -hmm. When they did the reappraisal populations, about 20 minutes later, we saw an uptick in testosterone and a um, downtick in cortisol for the students who did that. And so, uh, sorry, down cortisol, up. Up testosterone, yeah, which is good. Sorry, testosterone, 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 testosterone and good. cortisol. 
What happened to the cortisol? Sorry, did the cortisol increase or decrease? Cortisol didn't drop. Yeah, so cortisol. So it, well, it didn't. It relative to the control groups, it was lower. Okay. So even when even when we're challenged, we have the, we still gonna have a small increase in cortisol. The thing is that you have this other increase in anabolic hormones. Like, so usually DHEA is what we look at, um, or testosterone. These are anabolic hormones that sort of they're building up hormones. It's sort of they're things that athletes are taking. They be they be banned for a while. You can't take those because right. um, they're good for performance, and so you can't have those. But um, what they do, they counteract the catabolic effects of the cortisol, and so generally speaking, that's a much healthier and endocrine profile. And this is before they took the exam. So it wasn't afterwards. It wasn't that they just, they just did better and felt better. They actually were feeling better before they started, which was nice to see. Hmm. Yeah. yeah and, really fun it's a really fun field that's like a sort of constantly evolving. And then we're trying now to like integrate these appraisals with mindsets and do all sorts of fun stuff. That, yeah, the mindset. So that's interesting where um, I w- in psychology, the, the chain of information never ends, right? Like it's like, okay, this affects this, but then that affects this. And then you go, okay, but then I can go back to this point. So um, has there been any research into the why some people might have a tendency towards challenge or threat appraisals where personality types or experiences cultural backgrounds is there any uh, even i don't know biological profiles is there any um predispositions for one of those appraisal types um, one, one process that definitely plays a role is um stress mindsets so beliefs right. about stress not a mm-hmm. just general beliefs if you think stress can be enhancing that's a different kind of mindset that if you think stress is always bad so okay. there's a stress is debilitating mindset and there's a stress can be enhancing mindset. Okay. So if you have, even, if you're not saying it's always good, you're saying if it can be, like most people think stress is always bad. <laughs> and so it's just always bad. And so what you want to do, regu- like regulation wise, if you think stress is always going to be bad, your regulation should focus on down regulating the stress and like getting rid of it. Yeah. Being stressed. If you think stress can be enhancing, that's when you can do things like this reappraisal and sort of lean into that stress to use as fuel. Mm-hmm. And so if you have an overarching belief about what stress is, that can shape sort of how people use these appraisals. Like the appraisals are the tools that will change your stress response in a given situation. Mm-hmm. The belief system is like a, the, the mindset sort of like a lens that mm-hmm. sort of focuses on how, like, what you're going to think about and how you're going to do it. And so it's a more, um, much broader thing. And so we've been doing a lot of work with um, Aliyah Kroom at um, Stanford University. She does a lot of wonderful work with stress mindsets. We sort of built in some of these reappraisal um, messaging to the mindset messaging. And then with David Yeager at Texas, we've now made like what we call in synergistic mindsets. So it kind of combines this revamp stress, reappraisal stress, this enhancing mindset with their growth mindsets intelligence into a unified treatment that then is a, what we've applied across a lot. Of, we, we just finished a set of five studies with that. And those, those data are, I mean, we're pretty stoked about this. Hopefully they'll be published soon. So is that almost almost like a CBT style of training of re, retraining your mindset or? No, it's so it's really cool where we tackled um, this in two ways. So like how do you, the big challenges was like, how do you get people to do hard things? Like the stress right. reappraisal is like, we were going to the hard thing once they were already doing it. And so like think about the classroom, they're already in the classroom taking the test and we say, hey, right. do this. Yeah. But they need to choose to get, they need to get to that classroom. <laughs> And so yeah. if you think about a student taking, like, I mean, if you're an IB student, you're going to be choosing, let's say your math classes for next semester, right. you can choose the easier one. You're probably going to get a higher grade. You can choose the really hard one. You might do really poorly, but like that's pushing yourself. That's taking on some difficult challenge. And so um, David um, and I were thinking was that, well, at this engagement stage, so then you kind of go back to the BPS model, you, you got to engage first. Mm. So getting people to, even to try harder things. One of the major hurdles is these fears of like fear of failure. And so what does failure mean? Is this a growth opportunity? Is this something that means you can improve and grow or does this mean that you're not good at this? And so we were using some of these growth mindsets about intelligence and try to promote this idea that um, these difficult things, these are helping you grow. And so even when they're hard, um, even when you don't do well, you're still improving yourself as a person. And then once you're in the situation, we then apply, we call like the response focus mindset, which is the stress reappraisal stuff. That right. when you're in these contexts, you're going to have an uptick in all of these signs of stress and stress arousal. These are good. That means that you care. That means you're engaged. And this is fuel. So it's all the things that this is helping you. This is why it's helping you. This is why we have this, like getting blood to your brain. Like you're getting out these hormones that are helping you take on challenges. These are good things for you. So, so it's an interesting way, like just by combining those two things, we're able to um, clear what we have. We're calling a transfer problem. And so with like reappraisals, they work really nicely in the situation you train them in. And so like in the math classrooms, in right. the math classrooms mm. well, 
but does that person then apply that to like I don't know their sports game, their basketball game after school? It's it, so like how do you get them to go across those contexts? Um, this synergistic approach seems to do that pretty well, which is interesting. Mm. Um, but so what happens first? I mean, and what's more effective is it the, the the mind and the thinking, right? The the, um, the mindset is going to lead to the actions, or is it? the actions which then can help change the mindset because i know andrew huberman likes to say and and i've actually so i you know i love the idea of top-down processing and appraisals and this is why i like to teach it in class but uh you know he says it's very difficult to control the mind with the mind and i've sort of in the last few months really adopted the idea of um i have it written in my wall here ac action precedes motivation the idea just just do it like, i'm not ready for the interview but i uh knew i'll just do it because uh, approaching going towards the thing is just better because then you just figure out hey that wasn't so bad i'll get better next time but so the, my question is yeah is it i mean how, how do you can you change people's mind to then lead to the action or is it just a matter of just doing the action first which will then change the mindset the answer is both <laughs> so it's of so course it's like it's both. No, no, right. there, yeah so you gotta get you gotta get the ball rolling and so mm -hmm. changing your belief about what stress is, changing what, what does it mean? What does the stress response you, you have mean? But you've got to give somebody an opportunity to implement it pretty fast. It's practice. Like, mm -hmm. So that's why when we, we give them these, these messaging right before they do something that's going to be stressful. And so that's their practice. Mm -hmm. like we're just like teaching people out in the world now. And like, hey, like two months from now, remember this when you're in your exam. Like this yeah, doesn't yeah. work like that. Once you practice, you show, oh, I did respond better. That makes sense. And so what happens is that feedback we get from our bodies, the feedback we get from the outcomes, the responses we have, it becomes what doing you're changing the appraisal process where now it's no longer a reappraisal. That just is how you appraise things. Mm. And so you don't need to constantly be thinking that stress can be a resource and helping you to, to feel your success. That's just what you think about stress now. And so that that's the goal. That's like sort of our our um that, that's kind of the what we're always wanting to go after is that if we can get this manipulation this treatment this intervention whatever it is we're doing this like explicitly with you through like these training modules through um like ali does it through videos maybe i do it through sort of these like writing and believing type exercises like you're changing the appraisal um in that moment for that thing but is that this if you do it enough and you then you practice it you do it successfully does that do you now change how you think about things like that now and so it's not, you don't need to then go through the treatment again the next time you have the exam. That's just how you believe about things. Mm. And so we'll see this in our study sometimes where some people will just think that like, oh, like, oh no, like this is like, I like love being in like high pressure situations. I really thrive. And like some people just are like that. Mm -hmm. um, in this three, the reappraisal doesn't help them. Like, oh yeah, I already think that. <laughs> like, like yeah. so they already, that's already what they appraised the stressor as. Like, oh no, that's good for me. I want the stress. Mm. And a group we were, we were interested in studying, like the, so Rochester, where I, um, where I am, they have a really good music school. And so the Eastman School of Music is like a world-class um, training school for musicians. And there was a big problem with like students taking data blockers before performances. So their finals are like, they're going up and they're performing and they're playing, they're playing. And they have like really public stress response, they're really nervous. And a beta blocker is gonna block, it's gonna block the physiological response. It's not doing anything psychologically. And the feedback we were seeing um, they were getting they were getting is that their music was flat and so musicians kind of into their standing I, I need that activation to play like moving pieces because the emotion in it is part of the music you can't just remove that that activation piece you can't sit there and be dead calm playing something like a really like um like engage and i'm not a musician but um, i i can i can appreciate it but i'd be I'm yeah gonna play it um but that's it will be like an athlete i, I don't want to be dead calm before a game that'd be weird but if i wasn't yeah. like, excited if i wasn't like ready to go it's like yeah what's, what's wrong with me i mean i'm not a musician either so let's bring it back to sports uh the all blacks uh the rugby team they oh, yeah, they yeah. are very into awesome. sports psychology that's right and they uh their sports psychologist uh taught the all blacks about they, they called it the blue brain and the red brain uh, meaning like your blue brain the prefrontal cortex, the cool, calm control center, the, the red brain, right? The reptilian, the, the, the amygdala, the, the limbic system. And just talking about how you, you don't want to shut down the red brain because you need that exactly for the physiology. Um, but it's, but you need have to take the blue brain to control and harness and drive the red brain. And so um, it's quite, kind of interesting how, I mean, to try to explain it to a bunch of rugby players, right? Let's use colors, uh, but you know, like that's the same idea, right? 
Yeah, I guess at this point, that's actually, so the, it's the first time I ever thought about this. Like changing appraisal is the point where like, this is kind of how you think about stress now. And it just, it's, it's changing a whole thing. So the first time you picked up like a baseball bat or picked up like a tennis racket and you swing it and like, yeah, you can kind of swing it. And like, but some, someone needs to show you how to swing it and then you practice it. And mm. you get better at it. And mm. like eventually, like now when you think of a tennis racket, your swing looks like it's how it's supposed to or baseball bat, you're swinging like you're swinging it. Mm. Um, and I think that's a lot of what these manipulations is that like this is the first time you're approaching, you're considering stress in this way that it can be this tool that can fuel your success. Mm. And so then, then someone's teaching, oh, it's like someone teaching you how to swing a bat. And then the more you practice it and you can do it successfully, you, you get better at it. And so Kelly has a nice, Kelly McGonagall's nice way of putting this where you can get good at stress. It's a weird right. thing to think about. Yeah. But it re really, we are agents. Like we, we construct our own stress responses, whether we are aware, we are usually not aware of it. <laughs> but, um, so in so high school, in high school teaching, I mean, definitely my earlier career, I felt like my job was to try to uh, protect students from stress and uh, to, to try to reduce the stresses. And then really now in, in doing a lot of this research in the last six to 12 months, I realized actually it's that's probably not beneficial you're not giving students a chance to grow so yeah you have to manage it because you can't overwhelm but also we can't we can't our job isn't to remove stresses it's to give them the skills like reappraisal and to give them the skills and the, the the confidence the mindsets um the beliefs to approach and deal and learn how to cope with the stress right yeah we do a lot of what we call inoculation type of uh. is where like if you give people lots of little stressors, they can learn how they can use their responses successfully. And it gives them that practice opportunity. They implement it all the time. And so mm -hmm. if you're implementing this all the time and doing this all the time, it's sort of gonna become part of their level one. That's what that's how they think. And so lots of little stressors can be fine for people. Mm. And that's like I guess I just used to like daily quizzes or whatever their preference, but like it's actually like you get you get used to it. Right. And it's not and that's, a, that's the thing is separating sort of what is functional from what is pleasant. Um, stress often is not pleasant. Um, even mm. pushing through really difficult challenges in terms of maybe it's a really hard exam, hard paper, hard assignment, like mm. it doesn't feel great, but then it, it, you are learning. You do need to acquire skills. You do need to acquire things to, to move forward in life. Mm. And I think a lot of like this shying away from stress and sort of doing what's he's kind of going the path of least resistance is like yeah you might be okay but like you could you could be great <laughs> that's the that's the right. point so, yeah know, people doing great things aren't doing them by sitting around taking path of least resistance i mean if you're not stressed right you're that means you're in your comfort zone but if you're in your comfort zone you're not growing yeah that's uh, yeah exactly you're not pushing those boundaries so you're going to live within those boundaries and that's mm. fine with that but um, um as I've, as I've continued to procreate and have more kids and I'm up to three now and uh, getting more jobs and taking on more responsibility. No more man covered for you. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, I wanted a rugby team, but we might have to settle for a basketball team three on three. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, so, you know, my workload keeps increasing. And, and one of the things I've learned, and I don't know if, I mean, I think this is supported by your research. My best way of coping with stress is to just do the work um because when i'm when i'm working i'm not stressed because i'm doing the work like i'm so engaged in the job that i have to do that i'm not thinking or worrying about it because i'm doing the work um and it's one of the reasons why you know i i wasn't planning on starting kind of these types of interviews for another maybe year or so but i thought you know what uh, thank you very much by the way for sending me those materials for the study right the 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 reappraisal or whatever and i thought well let's just take this chance i'm not ready but that's okay just do the work and you won't get stressed and so i reached out and said hey would you do the interview but um and so i just just doing it just approaching it just do my best stress reduction strategy for myself is simply do the work <laughs> yeah I agree. There'll be, I'll even try to plan things out. Like, okay, I know we have a grant deadline in like January and I'll put my calendar, to like start working on grant in like some week in October. I'll just like have it and like do start writing this now. But I'm yeah. thinking about it now that like, I need to start writing about that grant. And I'm like, why don't I just write it now? <laughs> just do it now. And even though something's yeah. there, um, or like, we'll just always be pushing. Like, I want to just do something else. Do something, do that, that, it, the curiosity that, that I like, really like will get me through a lot of like, it's like, yeah, like there's so much like, you think about how like it can be daunting like it piles up and like it doesn't matter how organized well planned out things are like i'll still even be like concerned worried nervous about something that's months in the future 
where if I'm just focused on what I'm doing now and sort of the kind of getting myself into a high demand situation, like I just, I'll just start writing a paper. <laughs> so mm. I don't have to think of plan. I'll work on another chapter. I wonder if this is age dependent though, because when I was at university, every essay I had to write, I always went to the library, got the stack of books because we used books you know, back then and oh, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, got the stack of books and it was a month before the deadline. And I said, this time, Travis, you're going to write the essay. And I never did. And then, but I actually learned that I could write pretty good essays in about 18 hours. And I would just wait the day before because I had the stress and the deadline. And I just thought, okay. And, and I wonder if that, yeah, uh, with, you know, with, as the prefrontal cortex develops and we get into our later, you know, mid twenties and, and beyond, if then procrastination, not procrastinating becomes easier because we have a little bit more cognitive control, we can look to the future a little bit more. Like, is, is procrastinate, is it, do you, do you understand what, like, yeah. Procrastination is an avoidance of engaging with something that's demanding. That's kind of what it is. And right. So in that community college study that you mentioned that we followed up on, mm -hmm. um, the one that we just published, we looked at a model where we had student scores on it. So we, we did the um, stress rephrasal, they took their second exam. We followed them between exams and they took the third exam. Between the second and third exam, we had them answer questions at home, how much they were procrastinating. Mm. The people who went through the reappraisal thing were procrastinating less and that directly predicted improvements in the scores in the next exam. Mm. And so they weren't worried about that sort of uncomfortable thing of like, I'm, I'm facing knowledge I don't know. I need to engage with it. I need to learn it. That's, that can be, that's, that's demanding. Mm. And so they weren't doing that as much. They were actually engaging with the difficult information um, more quickly, I guess, or more mm. often when the control groups were. And like, I, I was like, I was at the office. I would get all, I would get done as fast as I could. And most people who like my, my one goal in life is to have not, no emails in my inbox. Everything's been answered. Everything's been addressed. <laughs> so I like doing things like they do really fast and then get the assignment. I think a guy started writing a book on that and it was called Inbox Zero. And then uh, partway through writing the book, he never finished it because he realized actually that's not the goal. <laughs> um, I, I think just about managing time management, I, I, I came across that. I, I, I need to know the rest of that story. But um, but yeah, I'm kind of the same. It gets, it gets harder and harder. Um, similar, I read some research in, the, in Europe, uh, not surprisingly said that the college students who procrastinated less stressed at the start of the term, more stressed at the end of the term come exams. Like, I mean, that just kind of makes yeah, sense, right? It does. But so procrastination is sort of a behavior that's, it's tied to stress. Like people aren't, they're, they're not wanting to engage with this harder thing. Mm. Uh, people would say, oh, it's boring. Like, no, you think it's hard. That's why you're not engaging with this. If it's boring, you just finish it and be done. Like that wouldn't be, like, mm. this, is, this, this is something that you need to do that's going to take effort. It's going to take mm. time. Um, and you're not doing it because you're doing something that's more pleasurable, but like this isn't good for you. <laughs> so you're avoiding the stressor. What, what's interesting I've noticed in the last few years, a trend, it's almost like the, there's now a million, billion, trillion dollar market in uh, self-help towards motivation and focus and productivity, yeah. almost, yeah. almost, almost rivaling the diet industry, right? Uh, and because I guess now, you know, in the past, you know, with the inundation of um, the sad diet, all the processed foods, there was that demand. And now with the inundation of media, there's now this demand for people to figure out, okay, how can I be focused and productive? It's, yeah, it's, no, it's, it's hard. It's a tricky line to walk. It's, mm. um, so in the IB psychology course, uh, stress falls under health problems. Is stress a problem? Yeah. No, it, um, it, it can be. <laughs> um, absolutely. So there are a lot of serious health consequences um, for the chronic, the chronic stress, especially. Right. So a lot of what I do research with is acute stressors mm -hmm. that have some performance aspect to them. Mm -hmm. And so these are things like giving a speech, job interviews, even asking me on a date, talking with your partner about a difficulty in the relationship or taking an exam. And these are things that are they're acute settings. So like they have an onset for the stressor and they have an offset. So like, let's say having a discussion with your partner about like some problem, discussion starts, stressor starts, stressor mm -hmm. ends, stressor ends, mm -hmm. so offsets. Chronic stress is different. I mean, that doesn't mean that you're dealing with day in and day out, that's, that's constantly there. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of work with like, you think about people living like in impoverished environments. Um, if like you're living in some place that's dangerous, like you're living on the South side of Chicago where there's a lot of violence, there you want to be vigilant for negative cues because that could save your life. Mm. Um, that that threat response and that vigilance could be literally life-saving in that mm -hmm. situation and so what is 
I'm going to help us survive throughout the day, it can be it can be very damaging to our systems over the long term. Right. And sort of this repeated hits type idea is that we experience lots and lots of stress over and over and over again. Yeah, we can address those. We go back to homeostasis. It's not such a big deal. If we experience so many of these, if you think about a light switch, like, yeah, you can turn it on, you turn it off. It goes off, it's off for a while. Turn it back on. Okay, that gives light, turn it off. If you're flicking that thing on and off constantly, you can get mm. a bunch of challenge responses by giving so many of them that it can create allostatic load. And that's the main thing is it's a really wonderful whole area of research on allostasis and allostatic load um, that ties to stress, it ties into chronic processes, ties into like, eating processes even too. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can create information, you can create, I mean, one of the, I think in the Framingham Heart Study, it's this ongoing like mm-hmm. 30 year study um, about health processes. The, I think the strongest predictor of a 30 year risk for cardiovascular disease is systolic blood pressure. Not diastolic. Systolic pressure is like when the blood's going away from your heart. Right. So it's, it's more tied to like that stress process, that pumping process. That's the big number. The top yeah, number. Bigger, yeah. It's just silly is when you have the heart pumps, it's going to yeah. force blood out through the aorta. And so like there, the pressure is higher. When diastolic is just blowing back. Mm-hmm. But in, um, yeah, but you see the upticks in things like systolic pressure when people are in these approach during stress days. But if you have a lot of stress all the time, it accumulates. Mm-hmm. And that accumulation, it's think about it. a lot of things to be good for us in doses, but when we get like, I mean, red meat builds muscles up, a lot of protein, protein's good for building muscle. You eat a ton of protein. That's all you're eating. Um, and it's sort of the same way. Like we can be good at using the stress using this response in situations where we need it. When we don't need it, if we have a response, even if it's like a approach or response, it's not going to, like, that's just, that's not necessary. It's not functional. Mm-hmm. Okay, so when we say like people talk about all the time, like challenges, good, threats, bad, like really it's about what is this functional in this context. Um, and that's sort of the main thing we go for, but yeah, stress, absolutely. Uh, yeah. I would suggest the students like dive into the work on how static load. Um, there's also really cool work on um, like perceptions of discrimination. So people perceive um, a lot of discrimination in their life that they've been discriminated against. That's a chronic stressor. Mm-hmm. And you see that influencing people's diurnal cortisol cycles. So they have lower waking levels. Um, they never, their nadir is higher though. So like, the, so we have cortisol levels spike when we wake up. It actually yep. helps us wake up. And they drop really quick with an hour and then it kind of drops slowly throughout the day. Um, people who perceive a lot of discrimination, they have a blunted waking response in cortisol. And then they never get down low enough of people who don't perceive as much discrimination do. So it's kind of this, this low level of threat activity that kind of always on. And that can have consequences. I mean, cortisol is a hormone. It does a lot of things. Mm. And so turn mess around hormone systems, endocrine systems, um, stress will do that. Um, that could be problematic for a lot of health outcomes. Yeah. I mean, you've summarized exactly how I tried to get it across to students. Acute stress, good. Chronic stress, bad. Acute yeah, stress. It can be manageable. I mean, it's like, can it be manageable? Is it, is it something I can address? I mean, chronic stressors are there and that it's hard to address them. If you engage in this reappraisal process for something, it's, a, it's not going to, you don't have as much control over it. It's, it's a different kind of, it's a whole different beast. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I won't take up any more of your time. I know, I think you've got kids as well, right? And it's late at night, your time. Um, thank you so much for chatting with me, talking about your research. It's, it's really cool to see it, um, to come off the paper and to actually be able to ask you questions and, and to look behind the curtain, so to speak. So thank you very much. Um, yeah, this is, I like talking about this. <laughs> it's fun <laughs> stuff. So thanks for uh, listening to me game around that stress for a while. Any day. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Cheers. All right, no problem. Thanks.